behaviors with that repetitive behaviors that a person does in response to those obsessions to basically decrease that distress, right? So uh, I have that image pop in my mind. I do something to, you know, try and get it out of my mind. And then I feel better afterwards. And the reason I want to make sure we're all clear about these terms um, is because these are, are really crucial for us to understand when we talk about where and why someone with OCD can become very angry, very upset, or have even what we call a rage episode. So to really understand that, we need to understand this kind of the, the what I call the OCD cycle, which is why OCD happens, how it occurs, and what it looks like across time. So the very first thing that happens is there's some sort of trigger. And that can be something that I see, something I hear, something I feel, something I think. But when this trigger happens, it then causes me to have that obsession, right? That intrusive thought. And that intrusive thought for people with OCD, when they have those, they view those as being very meaningful. So very important. Now, when I have an intrusive thought, because we all have them. Every, everyone in the world has an intrusive thought at some point. When I have one, I just kind of go, oh, that's my brain. It's being weird. Oh, well. And I don't pay any attention to it. But when someone has OCD, what they often do is they interpret that thought as being threatening. This means something about me. This is scary to have. This is a bad thought to have. Something is wrong. And because of the way that they think about those thoughts, the way that they interpret those thoughts, that's then what leads to these negative emotions of, again, fear, anxiety, guilt, anger, distress in some way. And when we feel bad like that, we often try and do something to feel better. And in OCD, what happens is you do some sort of behavior that's gonna decrease that distress. We call that the compulsion. And so what that behavior does is, yeah, it makes me feel less distressed right now. I feel less anxious right now, less scared right now, but, it also makes those thoughts more likely to pop up again in the future. So I feel better in the short term, but what happens is I'm going to have more obsessive thoughts. And then I'm going to interpret those thoughts as being scary, which means I'm going to feel bad, which means I'm going to do another compulsion which is in turn going to cause those obsessions to happen even more. And so this becomes a cycle we get stuck in if someone has OCD, where they have the obsession, they feel bad, they do something to feel better, but it makes it worse in the long run. And this happens over and over again. So here's an example. Let's say that I have what we call contamination OCD. So I'm worried about getting sick from something. And I might see someone around me who coughs. And that cough would be the trigger. And I'd hear that and I'd see them coughing. And then I would have this intrusive thought, you're going to get sick. And because I have that intrusive thought, you're going to get sick. I would then interpret it as that's true. If that person coughed, they're probably going to get me sick. I'm going to feel really scared right now. I'm going to feel anxious. I'm going to feel upset, which is going to cause me to try and do something to not get sick. 
I'm going to take out my hand sanitizer. And I'm going to clean my hands. I'm going to clean my whole face off. And I'm going to do that excessively. And that's going to make me feel a little bit better right now. But the next time I see somebody cough, that same thought's going to come and it's going to come stronger. And it's going to make me feel even worse, which leads me to do that compulsion again. And so we get trapped in this cycle in OCD. And the reason that I wanted to go over this, and I know most of you are probably very familiar with this cycle. You see it in your family members. You experience it yourself. You see it in your patients. I just want to make sure that we are, we're all on the same page because this is really important to understand about how and why people get angry and then have high levels of, for example, rage episodes. So what do I mean when I say that rage or a rage attack or a rage episode? Well, these are where I am showing aggression. I am showing um, anger in very, very high levels to very minor or small things. So I might scream, I might hit, I might kick, I might break something, I might threaten to hurt someone or even potentially hurt them. And we see rage attacks across a lot of different kinds of mental health problems, but we very much see them in OCD. Now, in children with OCD, um, our research that we've, that we've done has shown that within the past week, almost one out of three parents report their child having some sort of rage episode. When we expand that to a month, four weeks, over half report that they've had some sort of a rage episode or rage attack in the last month. So this is really, really common in children with OCD. We see this more in children who have higher levels of symptoms. So the worse the symptoms are, generally the more likely you are to have these kinds of rage or, or um, anger episodes and outbursts. We also see that they're more common in people who have sexual, religious, and aggressive obsessions. Um, or people who are doing a lot of checking kinds of rituals, like checking to make sure the lock is, is off or checking to make sure, um, you know, uh, a light is turned on versus off or the, the stove is off or whatever it happens to be. So we see this a lot in children with OCD. And in terms of how this manifests, we see lots of verbal aggression. So about 61% reported verbal aggression uh, in, in our sample. Uh, about the same number reported physical aggression, right? So it's not just that someone is only yelling. We see a lot of people yelling and then being physically aggressive. So trying to hit, trying to scream, um, calling people names, breaking things all sorts of varieties of aggressive behavior within these kinds of rage episodes or rage attacks. And these are most likely to occur at home, uh, although from our sample, we did see a number of them occurring at school as well, but much more likely to occur at home. Um, less likely to occur if you're with, for example, like at a friend's house or something like that but um, almost all of them are occurring at home uh, and they're typically directed at the parents. So the rage is, or the attack is directed towards the parents, um, primarily the moms in our sample, although dads were very frequent, um, but then other family members as well. So uh, siblings, you know, brothers and sisters, um, grandparents, um, aunts and uncles and other extended family. Um, but it's usually directed at some family member. Um, now, when it was happening at school in our sample, which, you know, you see about a fifth of those attacks happened at school, 
a lot of times they weren't directed at a person. They were actually much more likely to be um, trying to break something or attacking physical property as opposed to another person. But at home, very likely to be directed at the parents. Uh, our research showed that there were a lot of different potential triggers for rage. Uh, the most common one was a parent setting a limit of some kind. And usually that limit was not what OCD wanted, which also explains why the attacks were primarily directed towards the parents. So the parent is saying, we're not going to do this. Usually we're not going to give in to a compulsion. Uh, and then the child would have a rage episode. But we also saw it pretty frequently in response to just changes in routine. So here's how we normally do something. Oh, you know, we can't today. There's a disruption. We have to do something different. And then we see these rage attacks happen. We also pretty frequently saw them just from OCD triggers. So um, almost two thirds of our sample reported that just having a trigger of their someone's OCD was often enough to encourage that rage, that anger, the high levels of irritability. Now, after the rage episodes, um, which in our sample could last anywhere from three to 35 minutes. So pretty wide range, depending upon the child. Generally, the children were much less irritable afterwards. They were much calmer afterwards after the rage episode had kind of passed them by. So this is important for what I'm gonna show you here in a minute, right? So we've got lots of different things that can cause these episodes. Uh, we've got them mostly at home, uh, mostly directed towards the parents, but lots of different potential triggers for them. And the reason this is important is because the, that means there's not just a single reason why someone with OCD would experience anger and rage. And that for us is important because as providers, that means we have to understand not just anger and rage, but why is this particular patient having that anger and that rage? Because again, it can be for a lot of different reasons. It can even be for different reasons within the same patient, right, from time to time. So this becomes important, like we'll see here in a second. Now, we also have um, a fair amount of research on adults in, who have OCD. Um, the studies that are out there show a pretty wide variability in terms of um, how many people report this. So I chose our three kind of largest samples here. Uh, here in the United States, the biggest sample that we had, uh, the biggest study, showed that about 20% of people, U.S. adults, um, displayed anger and rage episodes on a weekly basis. Uh, in a large study of Chinese uh, adults, it found over 30% uh, who had at least one per week. And then in an Indian adult population, it showed actually over 50% that reported at least one rage episode per week. Now, for the adults, most of them lasted under 15 minutes. So in generally speaking, they didn't last as long as they did. Um, but that's still a pretty substantial time to be so anxious, so, um, you know, upset, angry, breaking things, hitting things, screaming, yelling, calling people names. Um, so last maybe less than the kids, but still very, very problematic. So one of the things that we found across the literature, adults and children, is that our having rage attacks seems to happen more frequently in people who have severe symptoms, but it also may contribute to symptoms being more severe. Um, because a lot of times this really impacts your functioning, 
and it impacts your family relationships. It impacts um, what you can and can't do in your community and then often harms those relationships because if I, as a family member, am worried you're going to attack me, that makes me kind of step back a little bit or it makes me do a lot of, like Jackie had said earlier, walking on eggshells around people, which is what we call family accommodation. And that accommodation by a family often results in more severe symptoms because their family is basically giving in to the OCD. And so when this happens and when the family members start modifying their home lives, their work lives and routines to avoid these aggressive behaviors, it generally doesn't make things better. It just makes things worse over the long run. People's symptoms get higher and higher across time, which means they're more likely to have more and more rage attacks and episodes across time. So the family will often do this with the best intention, right? I'm trying not to upset you. I'm trying not to make you get angry. I'm trying to prevent a fight. I'm trying to make sure you don't break anything. But over the long run, it only makes things worse when you, as a family, give in to OCD instead of working to fight back against it. And this can be very scary or frightening, especially if you have, you know, a, a child who's older or an adult who's doing this. And so you have to approach it in a particular way, which I will talk about in just a minute. So, again, what we see a lot of times is that, you know, my symptoms are more severe, so I'm having more rage. But because of that rage, my family, my spouse, my parents um, reinforce those behaviors. So they accommodate more, meaning they reinforce the anxiety, meaning you get worse over time, which means you get more and more rage attacks and episodes. And this is often very um, confusing for families because it feels like, well, if I do what OCD wants, then it should be fine and it should go away. But that's not how OCD works, right? So remember this cycle that we talked about and how when you do the compulsions, you feel better for a short term, but it leads to higher amounts of obsessions in the long run. So that means that when a family gives in to OCD, you're playing into those compulsions, which means you're causing in the long run higher levels of obsessions across time. Now, earlier I mentioned that there's a lot of different reasons why someone might display anger and rage. And I've highlighted three of them here within this OCD cycle. So the first is I might be trying to escape or prevent me from being exposed to a trigger. So if my family's telling me, hey, we're going to go do this, and I know that is something that's going to trigger my OCD, I might get very angry and upset about that because I know I don't want to do that. It's going to make me feel bad. It's going to be terrible. So we see people have anger and rage to prevent exposure to triggers of OCD. But we also see anger and rage happening if they're experiencing those negative emotions after having the obsession and they can't do their compulsions. So in other words, if they're being prevented from completing a ritual, um, if they're being prevented from avoiding a feared stimuli, anger is one of those emotions that could be popping up. And when I get so angry, I might then have a rage attack. Or we can also see that anger and rage attacks 
can be what we call negatively reinforced. Because if I engage in anger and rage attacks here, my family might give in to me and let me go ahead and do my compulsions, which means you just reinforced and made more likely to happen that rage attack. So there's a lot of different reasons then, and there's different points in this OCD cycle where people can experience these high levels of anger and rage and then engage in these aggressive, threatening kinds of behaviors. So it's not just one time. It's not just one reason, which is why we have to look at, okay, well, why is this particular person having rage and having anger? So this kind of cycle that we see can result in, again, these anger and rage components. And families not knowing can actually make it worse when they give in to the anger and rage or when they tiptoe around and walk on eggshells around someone so that there's no triggers. A lot of times what happens is you're just reinforcing that anger and rage. And I get it, right? Like, I totally understand why, because it's not pleasant to be around people when they are screaming and yelling or breaking things. And this is one of the difficult aspects of working with OCD, is that we have to help people learn how to have those negative emotions and let them go down naturally, as opposed to let them go down because you do a compulsion. So the good news is there is research showing that these things, anger and rage, can significantly decrease with effective treatment. And that can be doing cognitive behavioral therapy, that can be doing medication, um, that can be doing uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, you know, any of our effective treatments for OCD, you're likely to see decreases and you should see decreases in the rage if it's being treated effectively. Now, when we are working with people who have this, though, we are really probably going to need some extra things added on to our, our normal or our typical types of treatment. So for parents who have kids who have these rage attacks and episodes, a lot of times we'll do what we call parent training interventions, which is teaching people how to respond to aggressive behavior and how to reinforce the behaviors that we want to see. Like, for example, not giving in to OCD doing your exposure tasks in cognitive behavioral therapy and really helping the parents become very, very effective at engaging in the, the management of those behaviors as opposed to just OCD. Because one of the important things here is that if someone is being aggressive, you can't just say, oh, that's their OCD. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Because they're still being aggressive, right? They're still aggressing towards, you know, people verbally or they're being physically aggressive. And that's not okay whether or not you have OCD. So just because you're aggressing and you have OCD doesn't mean you should be able to get away with it and have no consequences. So what parent training does is help parents learn how to deal with those, um, those episodes, those rage attacks, those anger episodes, and deal with them in an effective way to keep people safe and to have what we call response costs, like loss of privileges or being put in a timeout if you're engaging in those aggressive behaviors. Now, for adults, a lot of times we'll have to go a little bit slower in treatment and we'll work on emotional regulation skills 
and being able to tolerate distress in adults so that we don't get to that level where you're having a rage attack and you're picking up a chair and throwing it across the room. So a lot of times we'll we'll take our treatment a little slower and make more steps so that we don't end up having that high level of rage and anger. So again, treatment can work and it can work really well. Um, I've treated dozens and dozens of of adults and children who have these kinds of rage attacks. Um, But you still have to target the OCD, right? You can't only look at the anger, right? It's not a separate thing. It's caused by the OCD. So you still treat the OCD, but you have to add on other aspects to help control that. So I really just wanted to leave a lot of time to talk uh, and answer questions, if I could, um, about this and about this aspect. Um, So I'm more than happy to do that at this point. Uh, And I think Tammy said you can either send them in in the chat or you can raise your hand and ask either way. So I'm more than happy to answer questions as, as long as there are questions to be answered. Yep. Does anybody have any questions? You can just raise your hand. Oh, I think there is a question uh, in the chat. So Margaret says, uh, if anger is directed mostly at parents and not outsiders, does, mean, does this mean that the sufferer is aware of what they are doing? So that's, that's a great question, Margaret. Um, generally speaking, people who have OCD are most comfortable having either their compulsions or displaying this rage around the people that care about them the most because they feel safer typically around those people and less worried that the police will be called or that they'll be attacked back if they aggress or something like that. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's I'm aware of it. It's more of I'm typically able to have these compulsions around the people that I trust and I'm safe around. And oftentimes those are the people who are then trying to help you with the obsessions and compulsions, which means you're likely to be around them more when you have one of these reasons um, that would be causing the the anger or the the rage. So it's not necessarily like I'm choosing to do this. Uh, So it's not a conscious choice of I will yell at my parents, right? Or yell at my spouse. It's generally just this is where I feel the safest for this to come out. It's a good question. Yeah, we have another question by Chai Ling. Uh, But Chai Ling, if you could, can you clarify a little bit? Because it says that if the rich is towards himself. Are you asking like what to do or or why why that happens? Can you clarify a little bit? Okay. Um my my son is uh he has uh a lot of uh, obsessive thought. Um he's very angry when he's very angry he will uh hit his head and uh sometimes slam his head against the wall. Um so usually what I do is uh, I will just I will calm him down. So um I, I don't know how to stop him from doing this again because I can only stop I, him when I'm around. If I'm not around, um, he will just do it. So um, I'm not too sure how to really talk to him uh, to prevent him from doing it when he's alone. Yeah, so, so that could be um, a couple of things. It could be I'm very angry and I'm trying to, you know, express that anger. Maybe I'm angry at myself for having those thoughts, right. That are making me feel upset. Um, So we, it certainly could be that kind of rage directed towards yourself. 
Or sometimes we see those kinds of behaviors might be part of the compulsion. Um, so I had a boy that I treated who, when he had a bad thought, I'll take my glasses off, he had to shake it out. He had to shake it out of his head every time. Um, and for him, he was having so many that he was having very bad headaches and he was having um, some eye problems because he was shaking his head so much. So something like that, um, Shay Lang, could be either be, it could be that rage or it could be it's the compulsion itself, actually. Um, now, if it's happening when you are trying to ignore the compulsions or ignore OCD, uh, if you're, let's say, not answering questions that they're asking, then that's more likely to be the rage, right? The, the anger coming out. Um, if it's just he has a thought and he does that, then it very well could be the compulsion. Okay, we have another question by Diana. Is hypnotherapy an effective treatment for OCD? Um, no. So there's no, there's no good research showing that um, hypnosis will help anyone with OCD. Um, our most effective treatments are cognitive behavioral therapy that has exposure and response prevention with it. Um, medication, particularly what we call the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, and those are our two frontline treatments. And then there are other medications if those don't work or that's not effective, um, as well as transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is now a, an approved treatment for that. Um, but there's no, no research showing hypnotherapy to be effective. Okay, uh, Margaret made a comment. It is the same with my child. He hits his head and harms himself when I ignore his rage. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is very frustrating, I'm sure, Margaret. Mm -hmm. uh, very frustrating and sad to see. Um, looks like Jean's question was kind of similar. Like, how do you respond, right? Like, if, if someone's doing that, what do I do as a family member? Um, usually what I recommend is making sure that they are as safe as possible. So if they typically break something made of glass, all right, well, I'm going to remove the things that are made of glass, right? Like I'm going to, you know, if you're hitting your head on a wall, I'll put a pillow up in front of it so that you can't hit your head on the wall. Um, and doing that kind of thing, as opposed to giving in to whatever the compulsion wants. Right. So instead of giving in to OCD, I'll just make sure that you're not hurting yourself or other people until that rage actually goes down. Uh, and that's that's usually what we try and recommend. Um, the the other thing is getting them in treatment um, and and trying to find uh, an effective treatment provider to work with them who can help. <clears throat> excuse me, can help to get that down as well and make it easier for them to. Um, tolerate that emotion and tolerate that distress. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Lang. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about how caregivers can better manage rich episodes? Any specific strategies and how to implement them? So um, a lot of times what we'll do in treatment <clears throat> is we will, we will get um, closer and closer to the rage, but not let it fully come out. So, you know, for example, as a family member, you know, if you know, hey, if I tell my child we're going to do this instead of this, he's going to have a fit and he's going to be upset and he's going to want to hit and punch. OK, so here's what you need to do then. Um, all right. We're planning on it. We know this is going to happen. We know that the child is likely to get upset. So. We'll take the breakable things out of the room first. We'll tell them, set them down, say, here's what's going to happen. And then, okay, you're upset, you're angry, but I'm not going to respond in an angry way back. So in other words, I stay as calm as I can. And we just wait it out, right? We'll let it come back down. We'll let that anxiety come back down. 
prevent you from hurting yourself, will prevent you from hurting other people, which is why we often do this parent training and parent management training um, along with this so that you have those tools to use at home in the moment. Um, and you can learn parent management training on your own for sure. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of really great books um, that help you learn how to do parent management training. Um, or you can have a, you know, a therapist who knows those um, be able to teach those to you so that you can implement them. Uh, it's harder if you don't have a therapist helping you, honestly, because you don't have someone else to say, okay, here's what's going on. Help me understand which way to intervene, right? Or how to respond to that, because it can be so different from family to family member. Yes, and sometimes we think with them, right? So it helps to model, you know, that you can also tolerate that distress and, you know, they can too as well. Definitely, yeah. definitely, Tammy. Yeah, so we have a next question by Anita. Does mumbling and using foul language, uh, is, is it a way to overcome his anxiety? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I'm assuming this would be somebody who's, who's um, having an obsessive thought feeling very upset or, or anxious um, and then starts kind of having that we would call potentially verbal aggression, right? So um, yelling or, or using foul language, um, potentially, yes. Uh, and, and it could be, I'm doing this instead of the compulsion. That's okay. Like, all right, just let it go down and you haven't done the compulsion. That's great. Um, if it's, I'm doing this to get you to let me do the compulsion. Then we would say, okay, well, you know, you can do that, but we're still not going to let you do the compulsion. Um, and we'll just wait for that anger to come down naturally, like it will eventually. Yes, uh, we have two related questions by Liao and Angeline. Uh, so what are your suggestions for family where, you know, the person with OCD is not willing to accept treatment and the person has rage? So um, this, this is a really, really great question. Um, and it, it differs based on whether you're talking about a child or you were talking about an adult. I'm assuming it's an adult because most of us just take our kids in, right? Like we're just like, nope, you're coming with me. Here we go. Um, but for, for adults, it's much harder because unless they're typically actively hurting themselves, we can't force them to get treatment. So one of the things that I'll do is, is work with the family to help them, one, understand, like, here's why this is happening. Kind of like we talked about tonight, right? Like, here's what's going on. Here's why this is happening. And the other thing that I'll do is, is have the family sit down and um, write to the person who has OCD that's refusing treatment and just set very firm boundaries. If you don't go, here's the things we can't do, right? Like I can't be around you this time or when this is happening because I'm scared for my safety because, you know, this is happening. Here are our options for treatment. I'm happy to help you with this. Um, sometimes if we can get the, the person in, even if they're not wanting to do it, um, if they're willing to at least come in, a lot of times we'll use what we call motivational interviewing, which is a way to help increase a desire to change. Um, but it's really tough if they won't come in at all. So if they're kids, it's a little bit easier because we can actually train the parents how to be the therapists because they're smaller, right? But as an adult, it's, it's often very frustrating and very difficult. Um, and leads to families getting very angry or, or just saying like, you know, you're not part of the family anymore, or um, which is terrible. But, you know, we all have to look out for ourselves as well as our, our people we love and care about. Um, and so, you know, I always find sitting down and just explaining, here's the problems that are happening. Here's what I have to do to protect myself. And if you're unwilling to get treatment, that's what this looks like. 
right? Here's what I will have to do, um, which is not wonderful, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and just to add on, I think, you know, sometimes after the person has calmed down, you know, really sitting down and explore, you know, why this person is rejecting treatment. Is it because of fear, stuff like that? And, you know, maybe perhaps having a support group or someone with a lived experience to talk to that might be helpful as well. Yeah, definitely. Talking to other people who've had that, maybe you have had treatment that has been helpful um, and say, you know, I didn't want to do this, but I ended up doing it. And here's how it helped. That's always really nice. Yeah. Okay. We've got another question from Gita. How do I calm my daughter down when she has an anxiety attack or anger? So what can family members do? Yeah. So um, this, this is, this is kind of a tricky one because we want them to calm down, but we want them to calm down without having done the compulsions. So that's a tough one, right? Because we want them to calm down, but we also have to let them calm down naturally. And so usually what we'll do with families is we'll have the families tell the children, look, here's what I'm not going to do when your OCD wants you to do this. So one of the things I see all the time in kiddos is that they'll do um, questions, right? They'll ask questions and they'll want the, the parent to answer those questions over and over and over again. And so I will have parents say, I will talk to you. I will not talk to OCD. And they'll get angry and they'll get mad. And I'll just very calmly have the parents repeat that. When you have a question, I'll talk to you. I won't talk to OCD. And that anger or whatever will be very present and I'll be screaming. You've got to answer my question. You've got to answer my question. I'll talk to you. I won't talk to OCD. And basically waiting it out, making sure they're not harming themselves. They're not harming other people or property. Uh, but if they're going to be angry, let them be angry and then let it come down naturally. Because that's the way that they see, I don't have to have that compulsion in order to feel better. And that's really one of the only ways to see that. So it's not necessarily about calming them down. It's about waiting it out until they're able to calm down themselves. Which can be tough sometimes, for sure. And I think Joyce had a related question that you partially answered. So it's answering questions that is asked over and over again about contamination uh, in order to prevent a meltdown, a way to respond to someone with OCD, right? That, that reassurance. So, yeah, Joyce, that's, that's actually a wonderful example of that family accommodation that I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, I think that I'm helping, but it turns out over the long run, it may be making the OCD worse. Uh, because, yeah, I'll answer your question right now, but you're going to be asking that same question again and again and again and again, right? And I'm going to have to answer it every time now. So instead of doing what I just talked about in answer to uh, Gita's question, which was, all right, we're going to have to wait this out, basically. Like, we're going to have to say, I'm not answering your questions, right? I'll talk to you. I won't talk to OCD. I won't answer OCD's questions anymore. And that is um, really, really a very potent intervention uh, for the kids because they can see that their anxiety is going to decrease without getting their compulsion satisfied, which helps them learn, oh, I don't have to do this in order to feel better. So would that mean you won't necessarily recommend like a comfort item or, you know, getting them to do slow breathing during that time, uh, during that waiting out? What, what's the parent supposed to, to do to assist with the calming? So I, it's fine to have them do things like a breathing exercise if they will we'll do it. Um, the key is not to have them do what their OCD wants them to do. Right. So having that giving in to the OCD 
is going to make it worse the next time. If it's, you know what, your OCD is really making you angry right now. Why don't we practice our deep breathing, right? Why don't we sit here quietly for a minute until the OCD goes down a little bit? Great, because you're not giving in and letting the OCD do what it wants to do. So does that, does that make sense, Lynn? Uh, okay, Diana, can I invite you to uh, just clarify your question? Uh, like the use of ERP depends on a lot of willpower and determination. My problem is my son keeps seeking what? Diana, are you around in the room? Um, sorry, just now, uh, because I, was, I wasn't too familiar with the tablet I was using. Yeah, no worries, no yeah. worries. You can ask your question. Yeah. yeah. Because I find that even though my son has been uh, to many um, those uh, therapy sessions uh, and he's been taught, a bit, taught the various uh, techniques, he often find it difficult to uh, apply. He will tell me that uh, you know, he's already tried already, but I still see a lot of compulsions. Yeah, then um, he often will come to me every day, um, you know, um, uh, basically, he's uh, tell me that uh, you know he um, he's very irritated with this and that. I find that you know it's a, almost a, I spend about an hour a day just processing the intrusive thoughts with him um, until he's sufficiently calmed down. Then he can actually function. So I'm just wondering, you know, um, perhaps um, this um, kind of um, counseling sessions that I have with him. Um, I mean, I'm just wondering how to get out of the situation, and um, yeah. Basically, that's my query. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, what you described, Diana, is is very common. Where you know, even though I want to get better, <laughs> even though I feel like I'm, I can do this, a lot of times those those emotions, whether it's anxiety or fear, um, you know, guilt, any of those, oftentimes feel so powerful that the person who has them feels like, even though I want to get better, I feel like this will never go away unless I get my question answered, unless I do my compulsion, right? Unless I wash my hands the right way. So usually what we do in treatment for that is we start very low on what it is that's going to make you feel anxious. So it's not that I'm going to start all the way at the thing that makes you the most afraid, right? We'll start very, very low and you'll conquer that. And you'll see that, Hey, that anxiety comes up, but it will go down because a lot of people with OCD feel like it's going to go up forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever until my heart explodes and I die. <laughs> and so starting off on those really low level things, where like this bothers me, but it only bothers me a little bit is really important when you're having somebody who's having that much trouble tolerating that distress. So, so maybe working with your treatment provider to start maybe doing some very low level exposures first. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, Dr. Caleb. Thank um, you. Um, Joyce, you have a question? question? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it is with regards to my question just now about the reassurance. Um, like my daughter will keep on asking question after question after question. Um, okay. Um, what I usually do is I will, I will just let her know that I will not answer her questions or everything. I will just maybe give her like answer question once and I, I, need, I, need, um, I sort of need a, a rule to her say that I'll just answer her question once and after that I'll not answer more and then she has to get on with her things and stop asking so I think at times it works sometimes it doesn't work but at times when it doesn't work is it okay to leave her as it is and just not confront her instead of having to be there because at, usually it's always in front of me that she actually performs all these and she keeps asking. So leaving the situation, will it help or is it not a very good idea? Yeah, so that, that that's a tough situation, right? Um, 
what I'd recommend, Joyce, based on what you said, is you know sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, my guess is that the reason she still keeps doing it is because sometimes you do give an answer. So what what I would do is is I would have you sit down with her when she's not questioning, right? When we know that's not a thing that's happening, and say here's what I'm going to do, right? You know the answers to these questions already. It's your OCD that makes you do them over and over. I won't talk to your OCD anymore. It's going to make you feel very upset. It's going to make you feel like I don't care. But I do care, and that's why we're going to do this. Because when I talk to your OCD, it makes your OCD stronger. When I answer, it makes them. And, and do it when she's calm and when she's very, you know, relaxed and explain that and say, so next time when you ask a question and I know it's OCD, I'm not going to answer and I won't answer again. And I'll even sometimes have parents literally turn around and ignore the OCD that much and just let her know. I'm not doing it again, because even if we give in like one out of every 10 times, that's enough for OCD to say, let's keep trying. <laughs> like, let's do it again. But writing down messages on the board, then she just referred to it, is also reassurance? Um, that's a good question. It could be. It, it could. I mean, it could go either way, honestly. Um, so if, if she's looking to get herself to feel better, like, oh, okay, that's a compulsion. I can look at this and I immediately feel better. Then, then that's definitely a compulsion and that's reassurance seeking. If it's, I'm reminding myself that this is OCD and I do know the truth, then that's okay. Uh, like if she's, if she's trying to use that to argue or fight back against the OCD. But it may just be reassurance seeking. So I don't know what's a better way because if not, she'll keep on asking and asking and asking. I sit her down sometimes, it doesn't work, and sometimes she melts down on me. So it's quite tough every day having to face it. So I wrote it down. I said, I do not want to answer questions, You're to repeat questions. So I said, do you like it? So she'll just look at it, and then sometimes she'll keep quiet. So I don't know whether it's reassurance. So it sounds like reassurance is what it sounds like, Joyce. Um, okay, so it's not a very good idea. It, it's helpful in the short term. It's bad in the long term, right? That's what reassurance always does. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Ken, thank you. Yeah, of course. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, we have a next question by Margaret. It is extremely difficult to get an adult to comply, very difficult to force them to treatment, and even keeping to boundaries. It, it is, especially if you're very close to them, Margaret, or if, if they live in the home with you. Um, it can be extremely, extremely difficult. Um, one of the things we'll sometimes do um, is, even with adult parents, have them go through basically like learning some of these parent training techniques and interventions where you start. One of the things is what we call differential attention. And so it's paying attention to those behaviors you want to see and ignoring those that you don't. And it works on adults too, uh, not just kids. It works on everybody. Um, and so learning some of those can be useful in terms of, um, you gently shifting their behavior and shifting how you respond to their behavior. And it can, it can be very frustrating because it's a, it's a grown person, right? It's an adult that's doing this as opposed to a child. Um, but there are still some ways to, um, to help with that. Um, even, even with an adult. So, um, yeah. 
Okay, uh, we have another question by Amos. Conversely, could you explain why a caregiver reacting back in rage to stop their loved ones uh, from performing the compulsion isn't an effective way of reducing the compulsive behaviours? Shouldn't it act as, as a punishment? So that's, that's, yeah, that's an interesting question. So why a caregiver being angry um, wouldn't reduce the compulsions? Well, the reason is because they're not, they're not responding to your emotions. They're responding to their own. And my emotions will always outweigh yours in OCD. So even if you, the parent, the caregiver, the spouse, are angry or disappointed, that's one thing. But what I'm experiencing inside my own head and my own body is usually much, much stronger. Um, and so that's generally not enough. <laughs> it's not enough to outweigh uh, those compulsions. And in addition, you're not always there being angry or being punishing when they're having compulsions, right? So your, your, you know, your loved one is having compulsions a lot of times when you're not there and getting reinforced for those. So even if they're punished once, but they're reinforced over here seven or eight or nine times, they're gonna keep doing it, even if you are showing anger and frustration. So really good question, Amos. Yeah, we have another uh, question by Jaceline. Interesting. So ERP treatment at home uh, is a challenge if an adult patient without strong will power. So what can caregivers do to remove the comfort zone at home while patient is doing the treatment? So that goes back a little bit to what I talked about in terms of like changing your environment and changing how you're reinforcing them. Right. So oftentimes just removing that family accommodation is enough to remove that comfort zone. Right. So, hey, no, I'm not going to, you know, make sure that I vacuum the carpet every day. It doesn't need it. It's not that dirty. So we'll do it, you know, twice a week. And just that sort of removing of an accommodation is often enough to get them outside of that comfort zone. And that's one of the reasons why accommodation from family members is so strong is because it usually helps, like it's creating the comfort zone, right? It's making it easier for OCD to exist because, oh, I'll do this for you, right? I'll take care of that. I'll change what our family does. And when we start taking those back, yeah, that comfort zone decreases, right? Which means that, you know, your, your loved ones with OCD start generally, you know, reacting or responding in such a way that you know, oh, yep, I was. <laughs> like, I was reinforcing that. I was helping the OCD instead of helping the person that I really care about. Um, so it can be a challenge for sure. One of the really important things I think is, is working with your treatment provider so that you're doing things in treatment that are very, very similar to what you're going to be doing at home, right? So that they can do it in treatment first, see that they're going to be okay, see that the anxiety will go down. And then when we shift it to the home, well, I already have learned that I, I can be okay, that this will happen or will be okay. Yeah. Okay, next we have a question by C.W. Yong, uh, quite a common one. So how do I distinguish OCD from routine for a child with Asperger's? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. It's a very common thing that we see, which is children with more high-functioning um, autism or Asperger's will often have very kind of rigid behaviors and things that they want to do. Generally, the distinguisher is whether or not they have an obsessive thought that's causing it, right? So people with OCD, they have an obsessive thought that makes me feel bad and I engage in this routine to feel better, right? To get that anxiety down. 
For autism, especially high functioning autism, it's usually more of this is a routine that brings me pleasure, right? Like I enjoy this. It makes me feel good instead of it's taking away a bad feeling. So it can look similar, but we have to look at what the, what we call the functional analysis. So, you know, what's the purpose of the behavior? Is it to get a bad feeling away or does it bring a good feeling in? And so that's one of the ways that we distinguish that, like a compulsion from a routine. A compulsion gets rid of a bad feeling. A routine usually brings a good feeling in. Hi, can I just um, elaborate on that? Um, my child actually mentions to me that uh, she feels uh, more comfortable or it's, it's not really a bad thought, but it makes her feel good after doing that repeated like washing. So should I allow her to keep to that routine or should I say, oh, this is your compulsion and you should stop? So how, how old's your child? Uh, 14. 14. Yeah. Are they washing like a, an excess amount? So like an enormous amount? Yes. So what she does before like bedtime, she will wash her feet and then she will come out from the shower, wash her hands, and then she will go in and wash her feet again. And when she comes out, she will open the door and then wash her hands again. Yeah. So okay. for her is, um, she needs to do this. And sometimes uh, her washing of feet can, can be three sets of washing her feet instead of t twice. So taking up a lot more time than normal, doing a lot more washing than normal. Yes. And if she doesn't complete that set of routine, it gets disrupted. When I knock on her door, she feels um, very upset and it will cause a meltdown. And she needs to go through the whole routine again. So, yeah, just based on that, it's hard to know whether or not it's a compulsion or if it's more of that kind of um, routine regulation like we see in, in autism. Um, so we really would have to figure out, you know, is she doing that because she thinks something bad is going to happen if she doesn't? Or is she doing it because this is just the way that it feels like it should be done? Um, if it's, you know, something bad's going to happen or I'm going to feel bad forever if I don't do this, then it's more likely a compulsion. Um, and we definitely do see people who have both high functioning autism and OCD, like that is very much a thing. So you can have both of those. Um, so yeah, it sounds like maybe working with your treatment provider to kind of help figure out exactly what's happening before that. Like, is it a thought? Is it a compulsive thought? Or is it more of just, this is the routine that I enjoy? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah at the same time, I think we have a related question that just came up. So does ASD and OCD coexist? Can they yeah, they certainly can. Yeah, they certainly can. Um, we see higher rates of OCD, especially in a high-functioning autistic population than in a general population. Um, not, you know, it's not a complete overlap or anything, uh, but we definitely do see high rates of all the anxiety disorders, including OCD, um, in people who have autism. Uh, Diana Yuan, uh, I think this was addressed by Dr. Uh, Caleb as well. So I usually spend a lot of time processing the intrusive thoughts of my son to calm him down. I guess that's not helping. Yeah, so if it's a family accommodation to help with the compulsion, then yes, that's not going to help uh, in the longer run. Lah. Yeah, so uh, next question, we have got VSL. Whenever we confront my girl's OCD, example, when she spent long hours washing in the bathroom and suggesting ways to her, she said we could add on to her anxiety. Uh, so you know, uh, I think V's question was that we are not professional. So does this add on to the anxiety or what should we do? Yeah, so um, I see I see that fairly often um, where kids will push back and say, well, you don't know what you're doing, 
right? Like you're not a professional, you're not a doctor, but that's no excuse, right? Like I still, if I'm a parent, can know this is not a normal behavior, right? This is not a typical thing most people do and that this is your OCD rather than something else. Um, So oftentimes what I'll do with that is, is in treatment, have the parents and the child, like the therapist and the parents talking to the child and saying, look, we're training your parents how to be your therapist. So when you're... They're calling you out on your OCD. That's your OCD. They're learning how to do that. That's a thing they're doing. And, you know, you'll get pushback, but, uh, you know, knowing that, hey, no, that's not a good enough excuse that I'm not a professional. Yeah, so uh, we have a question by King Lau, quite an interesting one. So my friend, uh, I think with OCD, uh, doesn't show rich, but quite the opposite. She's very cool, which makes me go into rich. So um, sometimes we do see people who have very, very high levels of anxiety that might potentially what we call dissociate, right? So my anxiety is so high that the only thing I can do is kind of step outside of it. Um, And so we definitely see that where people can just get kind of blank or very, very calm looking um, as opposed to yelling and, and, and angry. Uh, But it's usually the same reason, right? My anxiety is so high. It's just coming out in different ways. Um, And so instead of expressing it by yelling, I'm expressing it by retreating mentally. Right. So I just, I'm not here, right? Like it's just, I'm not here anymore. So we can definitely see that uh, and see that in other anxiety problems too. Yeah. All right. Uh, Yes. So we have a question by Yvonne, quite an important one. So as a caregiver, I often feel very threatened and scared when I saw my brother in rage, especially when he became potentially violent. What can I do in such a scenario? So I think one of the most important things, uh, Yvonne, is that you have to make sure that you're safe, right? And that could mean you leaving the situation. That could mean you, if you feel very threatened, calling the authorities and the police. Um, But we have to make sure that you're safe too. And so that you're not, you know, being aggressed on, you're being hurt by your brother. Um, That's one of the things that makes it hard with adults, honestly, Um, especially if it's a larger person or a male that might become more violent and you're, you know, afraid of that. So one of the things that I recommend is if, you know, if I'm afraid for my own safety, I leave, right? Like I make sure that I'm out of that situation um, because them breaking something is much more preferable than them breaking you. Um, And then coming back in after the anxiety's calmed down or whatever, and then trying to talk about, okay, well, what can we do to prevent this next time, right? Like what, what do we need to work on in treatment with our treatment provider um, to be able to potentially not have that happen again? Yes, definitely. I think to add on in Singapore, we have like the personal protective uh, protection of uh, order. So if you need, if you know, your care, uh, your, your, your uh, loved ones is actually violent, right? You might get that as a form of deterrence so that they know that you know, no matter what, they cannot hurt you. All right, uh, so we have another question uh, by Diana. So my son would disturb me in all ways to get my attention if I choose to ignore his attempts to seek assurance, what can I do? Yes, that's what they do, it turns out, is, is they try to seek that, that reassurance. And so again, I do, I just say, I'm not talking to OCD. I'll talk to you. I'm not talking to OCD. And I'll turn away. I'll ignore. Sometimes I'll have parents put like earplugs in uh, if their children are yelling or getting very, very loud, uh, but not giving in. Because as soon as you give in, what happens? Here comes OCD again, right? Now it knows, hey, all I have to do is if I get this loud, right? If I bug my mom for this amount of time, then we're still good to go. And so, you know, the first few times when you do it, it can often take a while for that anxiety to go down. 
but just knowing like it will go down, they will stop eventually. All right, we have another question by Suen. I think this was partially addressed earlier on. So in situations with domestic violence where OCD dominates and becomes an abuse perpetrator, what's the best approach from a victim's perspective? So earlier on, we talked about, you know, just living, you know, having the PPO. Anything else that we would like to add on? I mean, I think those are the big things, honestly. Uh, again, making sure that you're safe. The PPO, I think, is a, a great option um, if you've got that. Um, but making sure that you're safe, you know, is first, because if you're not, then you're not going to be able to help them eventually. Okay, uh, the next question by SK Chin. So when one gets triggered and enraged, how can the caregiver handle it without giving it to the compulsion? Is it wise to keep reminding that the person, uh, that OCD is at work, and can the person develop an inferiority complex? Yeah, so I mean, what, what I do, um, SK is, is, you know, I, I tell them, you know, that's OCD, not you. And that usually helps with that because what you're saying you're doing is helping them. We call it externalizing the OCD. You're not your OCD, right? You're who you are. And OCD right now is bossing you around. And so I'll talk to you. I'm not going to talk to OCD. That sounds like your OCD. I'm not going to answer that question, right? Um, I'm not going to give in because that's just going to make it worse in the long run. Uh, so, well, well, I like we've already talked about. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, the next question by Diana. So, what should we do if the OCD member retreat into his own world? And, okay, sorry, Diana, you might need to explain a little bit or clarify. What do you mean by EXP? Um, yeah, sorry about that. Because I'm trying to handle my son. Who's yeah, no worries, no worries. You can ask your question now. <laughs> yeah, because I, what I observe about him is, I mean, of late, because his anxiety increases, and then uh, there's doing a lot of compulsions. And I mean, I'm trying to try to remind him, you know, about um, using ERP and things like that. But he told me that, you know, it's not so easy, you know. And then at, at times, I do see him like just, just basically just uh, um, shutting himself up and then, uh, you know, just shutting his eye and then. Just is basically retreating in this, into his own world. And um, I, I try to ask him, then he said that, um, I, I don't know, my, my, my mind is blank. I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. So it's a lack of um, purpose in his life. So I really do not know much how to deal with the situation, apart from just keep on motivating him and asking himself to set targets, you know, and work towards it to achieve a sense of achievement and then uh, yeah, things like that. Yeah, so I'd just like to um, seek uh, uh, Dr. Lex's advice on this. Yeah, I, I think what I would do is, you know, if he, he's wanting to get better, he's wanting to do the ERP, um, I would make sure that he's doing the lower level ones that we can handle. And we're doing those over and over again and then taking pretty small steps up. And in that way, we can have, you know, lots of success, a lot of good stuff to build on. And then we take a real small step to the next thing, right? So it's not, unfortunately, a lot of people get excited and they get motivated and then they try and do something that's actually too difficult. And then their anxiety is too high. They can't tolerate it. And so then now everything's terrible, right? And, and I can't handle this. So doing those those small steps um, becomes really, really important with kind of what you're talking about, where somebody will just retreat and dissociate or, you know, uh, just kind of shut down. So I'd say really small steps and then doing a lot of that and a lot of that kind of practice on those small steps. Okay, Lillian, you raise up your question, uh, your hand. Do you want to ask a question? Or a uh, yes. Sorry, it's too long to type. <laughs> So I guess the question I have is, because we have a lot of adult uh, children who live with their families here in Singapore, um, a lot of, and a lot of time these adult children who have had OCD for many years, they have had family accommodation for, for many, many years. And what, there was, there's one patient I'm having in mind right now. Um, there is a history of family violence within the family as well, which makes it um, unfortunately then very difficult because the family is also understandably very frustrated over a long time um, about the OCD. And something that we've discovered uh, in our treatment is that part of the function of the aggressive behavior is 
a desire for the person with suffering with OCD to inform, to show the family, hey, this is how much I'm suffering. I really want you, it's a very distorted way of fulfilling that need, but it's, it's that I really want you to see and acknowledge the extent of my suffering. So he doesn't harm others, he harms himself. So he'll hit himself. Uh, and what's interesting is that his escalation, and I've seen our witnesses, the escalation is, is very rapid. So it is understandably then very frightening for families when they see that, and it's, like a, it's literally like a switch. And right after he experienced that immediate relief, like what we highlighted earlier, but then I think it's very bewildering for the family when that happens. So the immediate tip you're highlighting is, you know, okay, you can stay with it. Uh, but is there anything else? Because this seems like a very distorted communication, almost. Do you have any suggestions or any ideas? Yeah, that's really interesting. Like, that's, that's how I'm crying for help, right? That's how I'm wanting you to know that I'm distressed. I'm, I might work on some signals um, that he could give them when he starts feeling his anxiety increasing that, hey, here's the way that I let you know that I'm really distressed, that I'm really distraught, that I'm having a lot of this um, you know, anxiety or anger or fear um, instead of, hey, I'm just going to explode, right? Like, hey, I realize I'm getting close to that. Now I need you all to come in and, you know, work with me to be able to not show you I'm hitting myself because I'm so angry, but this is me being very distressed. Um, the other thing that I would think about is, is making, again, small steps. Um, and maybe even depending on how he feels physiologically, so thinking about maybe doing some exposure work to physiological sensations, not just external stimuli, um, kind of like we would do with like panic attacks. So I can feel that physiology, you know, that anger or whatever it is coming up. And then I let it go back down. And so I realize it will go down naturally, even if I don't express it by hitting myself or whatever would happen to be. So there's a couple of things I would think about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was helpful. So, uh, last question by Cor. Uh, is there a link between eating disorders and OCD? Being very particular about the quality and type of food uh, now from not eating earlier. So we definitely see a lot of people with OCD that have eating related compulsions and obsessions um, for sure. A lot of times that's about contamination. Um, so I, I can't even tell you how many people I've treated who will, you know, look at their food and check it for mold or not eat it if it's been open for more than two hours or something like that. Um, so we definitely see a lot of, of eating related obsessions and compulsions, um, but those are usually very different from eating disorders, which is more about trying to control how you look in some way, um, or like anorexia, for example, or bulimia. Um, we don't see that aspect usually in OCD, that it's usually more of the, I'm worried about what will happen if I eat the wrong food, like getting sick or something. All right, thank you, uh, Professor Caleb, uh, for you know being so patient in answering our questions. It's been a lot. So, uh, yeah, it's, very happy. yeah, it's about ten thirty now. So let's put our hands together once again to thank Dr. Caleb for spending his precious evening with us. So we hope that you have walked away with some valuable insights today, and we we'll hope to see you in the next OCD Network event. So thank you. Thank you all for having me. I really appreciated your time and, and being able to, to hopefully help you learn a little bit more about this. Okay, see you everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very welcome, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you.
Appreciate your questions, Gita. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy, and thank you, Jackie. Oh, thank you. Uh, Tammy, I have a question for you. Yes, Tammy. I saw in the chat. I'll call you on Monday when I return sure. to office. All right. Sure. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, do you have my number? Sorry? Do you have my number? Yes, I do have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Prof, you are, you are muted, uh, but hang on, I think there's some people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate being able to talk tonight, and uh, hopefully folks got got something out of it. So. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure they did. I think the questions were very relevant to, uh, you know, the struggles that they have. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. Uh, Fred has a question, actually. Fred, <laughs> Fred you want to ask your question? or? Sure. Yeah, uh, so I was just wondering, I mean, um, you know, in terms of the research that, that you've done, um, you know, um, is there a need to look at um, exploring or even correcting, um, you know, probably... In fact, you are muted accidentally. I said, uh, is there a need to actually explore or even correct family violence uh, within the family if you see early onsets of violence in OCD sufferers. I mean, where I'm coming from is, uh, it could be learned behavior. And so the first response could be, you know, seeing how maybe a father or mother has, has used it, you know, instrumentally in being able to, to achieve certain uh, desired objectives. They may then learn this uh, as a child. And this may be the first thing that they actually do to try and, um, you know, get that sense of, uh, compliance or accommodation. So I'm just wondering, because coming from a therapeutic point of view, we've never explored asking families about, you know, family history around, around violence or, you know, um, aggression. So what's your thoughts on yeah. this? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question, Fred. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware, honestly, of any research that has looked at like history of domestic violence or history of, um, you know, kind of sort of modeling that because uh, most of, most of the the work kind of focuses on more of how's the OCD specifically causing the high levels of emotion that then come out as anger. Um, but I I mean I would be incredibly surprised if it wasn't for some people very much a modeled behavior of when my like if I see dad his emotions get high. And then he gets angry and he yells. Um, well, apparently that's what we do when our emotions get high, right? So I, I think certainly um, asking about that makes a lot of sense um, in terms of, you know, working with a particular family. If, hey, you know, you've been modeling this behavior for them. Because a lot of times we look at modeling from more of the anxiety perspective, right? Like you're modeling fear, you're modeling distress and anxiety. But modeling that too um, would make a lot of sense, I think. Yeah, and I think the other, the other consideration to then consider is, is the parent or, you know, person still modeling it currently, you know, are they still doing it? And maybe they need to know that, you know, it might influence this child, uh, you know, from having that reach. Lah. So then maybe consider if you need to engage the family members uh, mm. to actually let them know. And, and you know, we, we probably need to change that as well so that the child knows that, okay, this is not right. Yeah, and it's so one thing because um, seeing some families which are not, uh, I wouldn't say dysfunctional, but you have one parent uh, willing to be involved in the rehabilitation, but other family members not wanting to be involved. And they're the ones that actually create, create the level of conflicts. Now, if they are then aggressive, aggressive. Um, they would then be modeling it for the sufferer, you know? And how then, maybe the thought is, do we then look in terms of looking at, uh, you know, um, a family therapist intervening if there's a need to, because um, going on trying to manage aggression when there is modeling in the family may be something that is quite uh, challenging. Yeah, I, I'd see it, Fred, as very much similar to when I have like a parent with OCD who brings their kid in, right? And they say, fix my kid. And I say, I think we're going to have to work on you first. <laughs> like, 
you, you need treatment first. Let's take care of yours. Because when you're modeling that anxious behavior or those, you know, compulsions, it'd be the same thing, right? If you're modeling aggressive behavior in the home, well, we're going to have to fix that first because otherwise your child's going to keep doing it because they see you doing it. So, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Caleb, I, I just let me check. Uh, Dr. Jaya Kuma, are you there? Oh, yeah, an iPhone. Uh, Dr. Jaya Kuma? Okay, you know what? Uh, I can just, sorry, sorry, iPhone and Jaya Kuma. I'm just going to remove you all from the group, okay? Give me a minute first. Uh, oh, Dr. Yeah. oh, you Dr. want to? Jaya Kuma, are you there? I think maybe away from the. Okay, because I know that they, you, you know, have he... a question, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Dr. Jaya Kuma. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Oh, so, hello. You're muted. Hi. Yeah, yeah, I'm. I'm there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for joining us. I'm just wondering whether you have any question for Dr. Uh, Lake today, Doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I watched it only a little late. I joined a little late. Yes, yes, yes. I can. Uh, no, no worries. We will send you the slides. So so information will be there. Do you have yeah. any burning question to ask Prof. Black? The same question. How do you see the, he's having a lot of compulsions. How will you slowly break down the number of times? He's going on repeating 300 times, 400 times like that. How will you decrease the frequency slowly? So, uh, so he's just doing the repeating behaviors over and over and over again. Oftentimes what I'll do is, is I'll have them do close to it and then stop. And then their anxiety is going to go high. Okay. Yeah. Well, close yeah. to it. Like your anxiety is really high, but let's, uh, has anything bad happened? Is anything bad happening because you haven't flipped the light switch over and over, Right. Uh, will anything bad? And so I'll usually I'll stop it part of the way and then I'll engage in that cognitive restructuring work and the arguing uh, really heavy to help actually turn their mind a little bit from the fact that they haven't completed the right number. Okay. And then that will let that anxiety start going down while we're arguing with it. Uh, and then say, oh, well, you haven't completed it. Oh, I haven't. Well, where's your anxiety though? <laughs> oh, it's actually lower. I wonder why. So, and then work a lot with that usually for the the people who are just doing the over and over and over stuff. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to know what is the long term prognosis uh, for this type of moderate OCD? At a lot long time prognosis. So, for people who, who've had it for a long time, like whether or not they'll be able to get better. You mean? No, no. I'm asking prognosis. How how they will live with that. In long term. Yeah. So, I mean, with proper treatment, prognosis is actually very, very good now. Um, oh. You know, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, prognosis was not good. But between, okay. especially the exposure and response prevention, the medications, and then now TMS as well is a good option. Um, I mean, it's very, very good prognosis if somebody actually gets treatment. Okay. That is nice. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. See you. Yeah. Okay. Bye. You see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Where's the Sorry, I does iPhone have a question also? Okay. Are you aware? I don't know who is iPhone. Oh, you don't know. Okay, okay. Then let's cut let's uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Then, then maybe uh, sorry, sorry, iPhone. Eh? Oh no, iPhone left. <laughs> okay. well, bye. Bye, Dr. Jaya Kuma. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right. Well, thank you all again for having me. I really appreciated it. Yes, yep. thank you so Thanks. much for really Thanks, uh, spending the time. Yes. Thank you. Um, it was an insightful session. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank I look so forward much. to talking with you all again sometime and continuing to to keep in touch, Jackie. And... Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, definitely. We'll keep in touch and we will be sending the recording to you as well.
lot of things that... Yeah, I'm so sorry. I started halfway because I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> That's I okay. Totally, it totally slipped in my mind. <laughs> Happens all the time. So, all right. Well, y'all enjoy the rest of your Saturday and uh, we'll be in touch, Jackie. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy your whiskey. Yes, enjoy your okay. whiskey. I'll go get some now. So, yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Greg, can you? Yep. Yes, I'll stay on. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. Huh? Yep. yep. Not whiskey. Don't.